good afternoon. I'm Elizabeth Davis, Executive Vice President and Provost at Baylor University. Many of you are here today because of the conference celebrating the 400th anniversary of the publication of the King James Bible, and I'm delighted to welcome you to campus. I don't know of too many universities that recognize the scholarly importance of assembling such a gathering that also have the academic credibility and faculty, such as the co-directors of our Institute for Studies of Religion, Byron Johnson and Rodney Stark, to convene this impressive group of scholars. I know we all have been the beneficiaries of the conversations that have occurred to date. But this session is actually serving a dual purpose, as it is part of the year-long symposium series celebrating the inaugural year of our president, Kenneth Winston Starr. Earlier this academic year, our president called us into a period of strategic planning, a time of contemplating how to carry out our grand tradition, pro ecclesia, pro texana, for the church, for the world. So the speakers for the Presidential Symposium Series were chosen for their expertise in areas that can directly inform our thinking about the future of Baylor University. Speakers who would challenge us to think broadly and creatively about higher education and the world in which we live. Today's speaker is no exception. So it is my pleasure to ask Dr. Thomas Kidd, Associate Professor of History and Co-Director of the Program on Historical Studies of Religion in our Institute for Studies of Religion, to introduce our speaker to you. Thank you, Provost Davis, and thank you for your leadership on uh, the direction of Baylor and the new vision. Um, Mark Knoll, as uh, many of you heard uh, yesterday, is the Francis A. McEnany Professor of History at the University of Notre Dame, and he's going to be speaking to, to us today on the place of the Bible in the modern Christian university. Dr. Knoll received his PhD from Vanderbilt and he taught for many years at Wheaton College before coming to Notre Dame in 2006. And he is the author of many books, including uh, The New Shape of World Christianity, How American Experience Reflects Global, Global Faith, uh, 2009, God and Race in American Politics, A Short History, 2008, The Civil War is a Theological Crisis, 2006, and the seminal uh, America's God from Jonathan Edwards to Abraham Lincoln, 2002. Uh, most recently published Clouds of Witnesses, Christian Voices from Africa and Asia, written with Carolyn Nystrom for InterVarsity Press, uh, just published. In 2005, uh, Time Magazine included Noel in its list of the 25 most influential evangelicals in America. And in 2006, he received the National Humanities Medal. And along with my mentor, uh, George Marsden, whom Noel followed as McEnany Professor at Notre Dame, Dr. Noel is widely regarded as one of the most influential living historians of North American uh, religion. And I would say that he's also one of the most generous and hardworking historians. Uh, not only does he maintain his own incredibly prolific and insightful uh, publishing program, but he helps so many others uh, as a manuscript reviewer, a book reviewer, uh, a generous purveyor of blurbs uh, for the backs of books. Uh, and, and these are often on topics you just would not expect him to be working on. It's amazing the things that he, he is able to read. And I, I think his, his good-hearted nature about helping other people sometimes actually uh, gets the best of his judgment. Uh, I remembered the other day that Dr. Knoll has provided a jacket comment for three of my books, uh, and indeed, he was the only person the press could find to do a jacket comment for my first book, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the now cult classic, uh, The Protestant Interest. Um, he, he, was, he was named one of the 25 most influential evangelicals um, because of his uh, intellectual leadership uh, among evangelicals generally and, and um, believers of all kinds uh, for calling us to be uh, what we should be intellectually in the life of the mind as, as Christians. Uh, and he has uh, manifested that, I think, in his uh, excellent scholarship, his prolific scholarship, but also his, his personal 
uh, integrity and, and generosity in the stewardship of the gifts that God has, has given him personally. So I'm sure that I speak for many at, at Baylor, uh, many at the King James Conference, many, all of us in this audience, in the world of uh, Christian higher education generally, when I say uh, thank you to Dr. Knoll uh, for your work and your example to the rest of us. So, Mark Knoll. Well, I'm glad to be in Texas where exaggerations are part of the landscape. <laughs> it is indeed a real honor to address you this afternoon. As it happens, I have personal knowledge of only a few of the con contributions that Baylor University has made over its long history to the uh, Baptist communities in Texas, and that in more recent years it has extended far beyond Texas and far beyond Baptist to a much wider circle of Christian believers and a much broader range of academic enterprises. But even this partial knowledge leaves me very impressed and genuinely grateful for what this university and its personnel have accomplished and are accomplishing. In a quick perusal of the Baylor website, I was surprised to see how many notable contributors I recognize in your departments of English, history, law, music, philosophy, religion, Spanish, and from the Honors College in Truett Seminary. I did not recognize names in engineering, computing, or the sciences, but, but I certainly know of outstanding achievements coming from these sectors as well. In the hard drive of my computer, I have stored a short paragraph that in, in the finest academic fashion I trot out on many occasions. And I'd like to repeat another version of that paragraph publicly today. Christian higher education has been given a special boost in recent years by remarkable developments at Baylor University. With 2012 now at hand, it is clear that Baylor's grandest original goals from the 2012 program have not been fully accomplished. But it is also clear that these efforts are continuing and that they constitute absolutely the most ambitious, far-reaching, and comprehensive institutional attempt in recent Protestant history to do the proper Christian thing for the life of the mind. Baylor University, in other words, stands as an unusually fine example of what an institution of higher learning rooted in the Baptist tradition can accomplish in a contemporary intellectual environment that undervalues undergraduate teaching, that dismisses Texas as the blowhard part of the country, <laughs> that takes little interest in Baptist history and that has almost no desire to learn what a Baptist perspective may contribute to the worlds of learning. I mean this tribute to Baylor and its achievements sincerely. But my topic this afternoon is the place of scripture in the modern Christian university. And as a historian who wants to do justice to this topic, I'm drawn immediately to two conclusions. The first is that the place of scripture poses a real problem in the modern Christian university. The second is that Baptists have contributed a great deal to creating that problem. I'd like to explore it with you today briefly while I think there is a real problem respecting the Bible in the modern Christian university, but I'd like to take most of my time reviewing main points of generally Protestant and then specifically Baptist history in order to explain why I think Baptist approaches to scripture have both greatly helped and greatly hindered the purposes of Christian higher education. The place of scripture in the modern Christian university is a problem because Christian intellectual life in the contemporary Western world requires an exercise in tight rope walking. The wire is strung between faithful devotion to divine revelation and responsible engagement with modern learning. It is much easier to fall off the wire than to maintain your balance. In the current American scene, we have several obvious examples of falling off the wire into a crass biblicism that disregards the legitimate benefits that come from simply taking a humble place in modern intellectual life. The most obvious example of this destructive biblicism is creation science, where a determined practice of 19th century literal biblical hermeneutics and commitment to persuasion by adversarial populism overwhelms 
the critically constructed best results of worthy scientific work. But there are other examples where zealous adherence to scripture simply tosses out the baby of well-grounded learning with the bathwater of learning abused for God-denying purposes. I'm thinking of manic single-issue public advocacy that claims to represent biblical politics, a runaway Americanism that depicts our nation's early history as the land of the converted and the home of the true blue evangelical, or the cruder forms of intelligent design that repeat William Paley's error of using God to fill in the gaps of contemporary scientific knowledge. The common mistake of those falling off the wire in this direction is to neglect central teachings of the scriptures themselves. If God made all humans in his image, if the ability to learn about the external world is a gift given by God to all those made in his image, if scripture teaches that believers in God are also susceptible to error, and if scripture testifies repeatedly that all people have a significant capacity for genuine insight on some aspect of human affairs, then Bible believers should be the first to expect genuine intellectual insights from the entire human community, especially in study of the material world, mathematics, and those aspects of experience that do not deal explicitly with humans standing before God. These problems are more obvious where the Christian element predominates when speaking about the modern Christian university. A different set of problems appears frequently where the modern or the university strands predominate. Falling off the wire in, on this side means simply receiving elite opinion in any academic specialty with no effort to assess that opinion by Christian beliefs rooted in scripture. I'll be mentioning some specific examples later, but for now it is enough to recognize the common mistake in this way of falling off the high wire. That common mistake is to relegate Christian belief to a private space that never intersects meaningfully with the public spaces in which learning takes place. If this brief statement about defining problems about the Bible in the modern university is anywhere near accurate, why do I think that Baptists share responsibility for the problems besetting Christian universities today as they set about their task? In what follows, I'm limiting myself to Protestant institutions, but in those institutions, the place to begin is at the beginning of Protestantism. In this brief overview of Protestant history that follows, I'm emphasizing those things that Baptists might appreciate most. The furor over Martin Luther's 95 Theses of 1517 is properly regarded as the flashpoint that instigated the Protestant Reformation. In light of later Protestant insistence on scripture as the defining norm for doctrine in life, it is noteworthy, however, that the 95 Theses contain very little direct appeal to the Bible as such. Instead, the Theses were dealing with questions about the theology and practice of indulgences. When, however, Luther's Latin proposals for an in-house academic debate were translated into German, and republished by several enterprising printers, it is well known that a wide populace responded with enthusiasm, even as the Pope and his associates responded with outrage. The ensuing controversy witnessed an almost immediate explosion of print, which in turn led to an almost immediate shift in the controversy's center of gravity. Specific questions about Christian doctrines certainly remained important, but almost immediately they were joined and frequently superseded by questions concerning Christian authority. How could faithful believers know what was true and who could guide them in finding out? The 95 Theses were posted on October 31st, 1517. Less than a year later, Luther was called from his own hometown of Wittenberg to meet a representative of the Pope, Cardinal Thomas Cajetan, in the imperial city of Augsburg. At Augsburg, the controversy over the doctrine and practice of indulgences almost instantly expanded into controversy over the use and authority of scripture. Luther wanted to cite the Bible to defend his positions, but Cajetan never took the bait. He insisted instead that Luther had to return to the established teachings of the church. 
Since the spheres of religion and society were so intimately conjoined in early modern Europe, Luther's challenge to religious authority was quickly perceived as a challenge to authority in general. That broader challenge was apparent when Luther traveled in April 1521 to an imperial diet convened by the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. If Charles lacked experience as an emperor and if he, everything spoken in German had to be translated for him into Latin, he nonetheless represented at Worms the personal embodiment of Christendom. And this was the ideal built up over seven centuries that the interests of religion and society could be harmonized in one completely integrated whole. Before such an august personage representing such a well-established ideal, Martin Luther appeared as a solitary monk who in his private spiritual journey had become convinced that scripture taught much that the Pope, the Emperor, and all of Christendom had tragically misconstrued. When Luther came before the imperial court, he said he would recant what he, would written, what he had written, but only upon one condition. That condition amounted to a quintessentially Protestant challenge. He said, therefore I ask by the mercy of God, may your most serene majesty, most illustrious lordships, or anyone at all who is able, either high or low, bear witness, expose my errors, overthrowing them by the writings of the prophets and the evangelists. That statement did not satisfy the emperor, who asked Luther to say more. And in response came these famous words. Since then your serene majesty and your lordship seek a, sim seek a simple answer, I will give it. Unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason, for I do not trust either in the pope or in councils alone, since it is well known that they have often erred and contradicted themselves, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not retract anything, since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. This dramatic statement in the most august setting defined a baseline for all later Protestants, and especially Baptists. They would follow the Bible before all other authorities, even when, as many Baptists later concluded, the Bible taught truths at variance from what Luther had found in the scriptures. The statement also defined a second landmark that has been crucial for Baptist development from that time forward. My conscience, or the individual Bible reader, aware of standing before the face of God, would be the final guide for interpreting the supremely authoritative scripture. But potential problems for this combination of Bible plus conscience were apparent from the start. Immediately after Luther had finished speaking his piece, the emperor's spokesman called upon him to account for setting himself up as superior to the great councils of the Catholic Church that had already ruled on many of the issues Luther was addressing, said the spokesman. In this, Martin Luther, you are completely mad. Then he went on with words that forecast any number of problems in the later history of Protestant university life. For what purpose does it serve to raise a new dispute about matters condemned through so many centuries by church and council? unless perhaps a reason must be given to just anyone about anything whatsoever. But if it were granted that whoever contradicts the councils and the common understanding of the church must be overcome by scripture passages, we will have nothing in Christianity that is certain or decided. What the spokesman saw perceptively was that conscience alone plus scripture alone had the potential for incessant intellectual instability. Yet by the time the emperor and the pope's representative figured out what they wanted to do with Luther, he had long since left Worms. Luther's prince, the elector Frederick of Saxony, was torn between a desire to protect the theologian who was bringing his little uh, uh, kingdom renown and the need to show deference to the emperor. Frederick's creative response was to maintain a public position of non-committed impartiality while arranging under strictest secrecy for Luther to be kidnapped and spirited away to a secret retreat, the castle Wartburg near Eisenach. As 
soon as Luther was settled at the Wartburg Castle, he turned his great energy to preparing a German language translation of the New Testament. The result in only a few short months was Luther's 1522 German New Testament. It was immediately noteworthy for the chance it gave Luther to accentuate the themes of scripture that most directly influenced his reforming fire. A much noticed instance was his translation of a key passage about faith and justification found toward the end of the third chapter of Paul's epistle to the Romans. Luther added the word align, alone, to what the apostle had said, believers are justified without, but justified without the works of the law by faith. A second noteworthy feature of Luther's first momentously important New Testament was its annotations, which came in two forms. In slender margins alongside the translated text of scripture, Luther inserted quotations from what he considered pertinent Old Testament texts and also explained what he felt the New Testament authors were trying to say. He also supplied prefaces, first to the New Testament as a whole and then to each of the individual books. And I believe we heard earlier today from Philip Jenkins some excerpts from uh, Luther's prefaces to the book of James and Hebrews and, and others. In the general preface to the entire New Testament, Luther told why there needed to be a preface at all. His very first sentence explained that it would be right and proper for this book to go forth without any prefaces or extraneous names attached and simply to have its own say under its own name. Yet, Luther went on to provide a pre preface because he said in his words, many unfounded interpretations have scattered the thought of Christians to a point where no one any longer knows what is gospel or law, New Testament or old. It was therefore a necessity for Luther to give some notice by which the ordinary man can be rescued from his former delusions, set on the right track, and taught what he is to look for in this book, so that he may not seek laws and commandments where he ought to be seeking the gospel and promises of God. This very first Protestant translation mingled the ideal and the real as they would be consistently mingled in Protestant history, and no more, nowhere more thoroughly than in American experience. The ideal was biblical authority alone. The real was constant effort by those with authority to make sure that others were carefully guided so that they could get, grasp what the Bible alone really meant. One more incident in Luther's early reforming career is pertinent. While Luther was hidden away at the Wartburg Castle, colleagues who shared his desire for reform got to work. They were led by an older university professor, Andreas Bodenstein von Karlstadt, who believed that a right interpretation of scripture demanded many things and many faster changes than Luther desired. So, in short order, Karlstadt drastically simplified the ritual of the mass, he led in the destruction of, of artistic images in Wittenberg churches, and he took many other radical steps. Luther and the elector Frederick were furious to check what they saw not as reform, but as a rush into chaos, Frederick called Luther back to Wittenberg to deliver a series of sermons during Lent. And then Frederick, with Luther's full backing, banished Karlstadt from Saxony because Karlstadt's interpretations of scripture seemed so dangerous to both the elector Frederick and the theologian Martin Luther. This incident is particularly relevant to Baptist history because Baptists would long stand with Karlstadt and protest against heavy-handed authority that constrained free exercise in following free interpretations of the Bible. So here's how things stood with the Bible before the Protestant Reformation was even 10 years old. Scripture is God's written revelation that can nonetheless be corrupted by self-seeking church officials was the supreme authority for all of life's important questions. Moreover, the individual standing humbly before God could follow his own conscience, and quite a bit later, her own conscience, in grasping the message of scripture. In turn, that clear perception could purify Christian teaching, reform church corruption, and bring new life in the Holy Spirit to individuals and Christian communities alike. But of course, this is not all. 
Since few could read the Bible's original Greek and Hebrew for themselves, it was necessary for translations to be prepared so that people could read scripture in vernacular languages. But wherever translation takes place, the labors of the translators shade the final product. For scripture, a translated text is no longer the Bible alone. And there's more. As soon as there was a Protestant movement appealing to scripture as ultimate authority, there were Protestant movements differing on how best to interpret the supremely authoritative scripture. Some of those differences were minor, some were literally deadly in the effect they had on those who maintained them. And so began the Protestant swinging to and fro that has gone on since late in 1517 to this day. Strong assertions of conscience captive to the word of God are pulled back by authoritative directives from religious or intellectual or political leaders about what your conscience is supposed to find when it opens the scriptures. For the long-term future of higher education, what Baptists did with the baseline Protestant commitment to both scripture and the individual conscience had momentous consequences. I've been privileged recently to read two really solid books on the history of Baptists worldwide that show how Protestantism took a particularly significant turn when Baptists emerged on the scene. One is Robert Johnson's A Global Introduction to Baptist Churches, and the other is David Bebbington's Baptist Through the Centuries, which I believe had its origins in this very building. Both authors do a fine job in making Baptist history comprehensible, but indirectly, they both also show the great potential contribution of Baptist to modern higher education, along with the great problem that Baptist traditions created for university life. Johnson and Bebbington detail clearly that Baptists were offshoots of the English Puritan movements that insisted upon scriptura sola, the Bible alone, as the, as the only reliable basis for faithful Christianity and the most effective source for correcting the halfway reforms of the established Church of England. From that earliest history, a very high view of biblical authority has remained central to almost all later Baptist movements. Yet even more distinctly, Baptist has been the way that this loyalty to scripture was practiced. Baptists pushed the logic of the priesthood of all believers beyond where most of their fellow Protestants wanted to stop. In the Baptist view, a properly functioning Christianity required not just diligence in following scripture, but the personal and intentional commitment of each church member to practice that diligence. For Baptists, common Protestant teaching about the lordship or kingship or, or, of Christ was taken to mean that no intermediate authority should stand between God and the gathering of his people to worship him. Movement from a desire for more thorough reform to the creation of distinctly Baptist churches occurred early in the 17th century. Dissenters who had already separated from the national church and fled to Holland in order to find greater religious freedom provided the spark. In the year 1609, John Smith, a Cambridge trained separate, baptized himself and a few others and so created the first Baptist church. Not of Houston, not of Dallas, not of Waco, but the first Baptist church. <laughs> Smith, Smith himself remained only briefly with the Baptist congregation he established before moving on in further quest for true religion. More stable leaders like Thomas Ellis provided continuity of leadership and also brought Baptist principles back to England where the movement gradually spread. These earliest Baptists were general because they believed in the potential efficacy of Christ's death for all humans. They were in theological terms Arminians who stressed the freedom of the human will. Before long, however, they were joined by particular Baptists who maintained the era's standard Calvinist teaching that Christ died particularly for the elect rather than for humanity as a whole. Within a generation from their founding, both generals and particulars would be baptizing by immersion, the standard practice that distinguishes Baptist churches around the world to this day. Baptists soon developed extensive arguments drawn from the Bible alone to defend the practice of adult baptism by immersion upon personal profession of faith. 
Yet this approach to baptism represented even more a protest against the idea of inherited or bestowed Christian identification symbolized by the traditional practice of infant baptism. To be a follower of Christ meant to commit oneself personally rather than to rely upon the mediation of family, church, or supposedly Christian society. The broad pre-conviction underlying the specific baptismal practice was a positive vision of the self's individual responsibility under God and a negative vision of human institutions or traditions as distorting this key personal relationship. In turn, the combination of positive and negative commitments gave birth to the principles that have forever after resounded through Baptist history. Religious freedom, the right of private judgment, soul competency, and a gathered church. A moving recapitulation of these commitments was offered in 1861 by Johann Gerhard Onken, the great pioneer of Baptist life in Germany, when he stood before a monument to Martin Luther in the same city of Worms where Luther had made his famous protest to Charles V. Said Onken, I rejoiced that the spirit to think that the spirit of Martin Luther can never be quite extinguished while the word of God, which he gave us in our native tongue, shall exist. Yes, we Baptists owe him our best treasure, and we shall do well ever to keep before us Luther's heroic example of non-submission to worldly power in matters of religion. For Christian higher education, especially higher education at a Protestant university, this Baptist anchorage in scripture has made a positive and fundamental contribution. The 1925 mission and, and faith and mission statement of the Southern Baptist Convention has often been quoted for how it defines scripture. It has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter. It has been less often quoted for what the statement claims about what the Bible offers the principles by which God will judge us, the true center of Christian union, and the supreme standard by which all human conduct, creeds, and relig religious opinions should be tried. But these last phrases are the ones that suggest the imperative importance of scripture for human learning. Because the Bible offers an infallible message of salvation, it offers as well a fruitful guide to everything that human beings do and believe. In other words, to the subjects that constitute the curriculum of a modern university. The great gift of the Baptist tradition to higher education is the constant reminder that without scripture personally applied, there is no Christian foundation upon which to construct the edifice of learning. To expand upon the insight of J.G. Onken, Baptist anchorage in scripture provides the resources for non-submission to worldly powers in academic life and not just in matters of religion specifically. As any academic with even the slightest self-awareness recognizes, the force of worldly powers or accepted conventions in academic life can be all but overwhelming. For example, if conventions of scientific reasoning do not allow for a consideration of teleology, it is very difficult for individual Christian scholars to consider nature under the aegis of divine providence. When influential eth ethicists take for granted that if something can be done in medicine or the human sciences, it should be done, Christian voices that seek a higher ethical standard can be easily cowed. If conventions in academic history strictly limit depictions of the past, to what has been determined by economic, political, gender, or ideological forces, Christian historians may flounder in trying to say anything different. If mainline economists treat all human choices as mere calculations of maximized personal advantage, how can believing economists who want to say more respond? If legal scholars, literature professors, or religionists insist upon regarding all human relationships as mere constructions of the human appetite for power, it can be precarious for Christian voices to attempt alternative explanations. In other words, 
against the tremendous force of academic conviction, sorry, against the tremendous force of academic convention, it takes a force like scripture, defined as Baptists have, de have defined it, as the fully trustworthy word of God to retain a Christian perspective. Moreover, against the powers of the academy at large, even a general trust in scripture will not avail unless scholars have personally appropriated the Bible in the manner that the Baptists have always stressed. All academics who long to see a properly authoritative scripture functioning as a central source of wisdom, direction, insight, guidance, illumination, and inspiration should be grateful to Baptists for insisting on the supremacy of scripture and to Baptist traditions for defending the rights of individual conscience against the hegemonic control of worldly powers. This is the place in the talk for the amen. <laughs> and now I can go on. Yet, having, having an anchor in scripture amidst the seas of academic turbulence is of course only part of the picture. The Baptist history that offers such positive potential for a Christian university has also created real problems to which we now turn. Significantly, it is important to note that the problems have been there from the beginning. As the histories by David Bebbington and Robert Johnson reveal clearly, once early Baptists got beyond the common approach to baptism itself, the foundational Baptist principles of soul competency, religious freedom, the right of private judgment, and a gathered church did not lead to a common theology, common church practices, common attitudes to social engagement, or common approaches to intellectual challenges. Almost inevitably, the very principles that Baptists shared made it difficult for Baptists to agree among themselves. The fierce determination not to let worldly authorities come between scripture and the individual believer was matched by a corresponding inability to agree on what scripture required. And so within a less than a century of organized Baptist existence, differences emerged in response to a number of divisive questions that led to the creation of many separate Baptist denominations. Was the atonement general, as the generals claimed, or specific, as particulars urged? Should adults who were baptized also receive the laying on of hands? Should the day for public worship be the Sabbath, Saturday, or the first day, Sunday? Should local leaders accept the validity of adult baptism done elsewhere? Should they require the rebaptism of those who had received infant baptism? Should Baptist fellowships have confessions of faith? Should churches follow Christ's command literally to wash one another's feet? Should Baptists take part in politics or hold aloof? Should conferences of Baptist churches or leaders of those conferences be given any authority within local congregations? For each of these questions, sincere believers in the 17th century were able to cite biblical chapter and verse that were completely convincing to themselves, but that did not convince other Baptists. And in the centuries since, of course, such questions have only multiplied. For those who think this is a problem only of the deep past, consider more recent Baptist history. Let us imagine that you are a Baptist interested in guidance from other Baptists who, like you, trust in scripture alone, plus the conscience alone, on questions about the Bible's most important teachings. Will you line up with the orthodox experientialist E.Y. Mullins, the modernist Henry Emerson Fosdick, the radical Harvey Cox, or the evangelical Carl F.H. Henry? Or say that you're a Baptist seeking guidance from other Baptists on questions of social responsibility. Would you look to Walter Rauschenbusch, J. Frank Norris, Henley, Helen Barrett Montgomery, Martin Luther King Jr., Will Campbell, or Albert Moeller. Or maybe you seek Baptist counsel on questions about what Christian believers should learn from other religious or intellectual perspectives. Will it be Shaler Matthews, who was enraptured by the Eurekas of modern social science? A. H. Strong, who joined cautious appropriation of evolution to classical Christian orthodoxy? the self-labeled fundamentalist Jerry Falwell, the Calvinist John Piper, or the post-foundationalist James McClendon. 
Or if you want to describe a classic Baptist approach to American political life, will you find it with Mark Hatfield, Jimmy Carter, Bill Clinton, Mike Huckabee? These hypothetical questions underscore the difficulty in moving beyond the Baptist embrace of scripture plus conscience to even relatively secure perspectives on some of the most important general questions of human existence. The term Baptist does define specific attitudes and definite dispositions, but it def offers almost no help in defining particular theological, intellectual, or academic stances beyond those attitudes or dispositions. Other Christian traditions also manifest great internal diversity, but I think I'm in the home of the champions today with the Baptists. <laughs> so if I've described accurately the potential Baptist contribution to academic life with its firmness on scripture and conscience, but also the Baptist problem for academic life with the absence of specific guidance from that firm commitment, how then can a Baptist university maximize the potential of its Baptist heritage while addressing the problems of that heritage. I don't think there's anything revolutionary in what I'm about to recommend, and I think, I'm quite sure in fact, that what I will be outlining is already taking place at Baylor University and maybe some other Baptist institutions as well. But it would be a great boon to Christian higher learning more generally for Baptists to be as open and above board about what have already become their best academic practices. The first step involves pushing back just a little from confidence in what my own conscience tells me about how to interpret the Bible. This first step means taking a sobering lesson from the fact that in the United States there exist at least 75 Baptist denominations all claiming to follow the scriptures alone. The appeal is not to abandon the Baptist insistence on soul competency on or give up the right of private judgment, it is rather to keep the dispositions in check that were so admirable in the struggle against tyranny, but now have become intellectually self-defeating in an environment where ty tyranny comes from democratic majorities rather than from power-wielding despots. Baptist traditions have not been renowned for intellectual humility, or a willingness to tolerate intellectual ambiguity. Yet self-denial toward the particularities of one's own individual understanding of scripture is for Christian academic life the only way to go. A second step is to admit that all interpretations of scripture and likewise all academic practices depend all the time on some kind of tradition or conventions that are simply taken for granted or on unspoken assumptions that no one has thought to challenge. Baptists know what I'm talking about. If you've ever sat in a crowded church where a rapt congregation seems ready to follow a captivating preacher through hell and high water, even if the preacher is preaching on the Bereans who knew when new teaching arrived to test whether these things are so. Baptists are also familiar with the ironclad control that unwritten traditions can in exert on the worship practices of churches that don't have liturgies that are proudly non-liturgical. Baptist guru, Baptist kingpin, Baptist czar, Baptist boss, all these phrases are oxymorons. <laughs> Yet, you do not have to know a lot of Baptist history to know how frequently gurus, kingpins, czars, and bosses have shown up among the Baptists. It's the same for the organization of university life in contemporary America. If we think that we need a, a private interpretation in decisions about how to divide intellect, into intellectual life into departments, how to bestow academic credit, credit, whether we should sponsor varsity sports or not, organizing student housing, if all of these decisions had to spring from the right of private judgment, we would be deluding ourselves. For this second step, self-examination, self-reflection, self-honesty, and a healthy dose of general self-awareness, deliver the message that traditions themselves are not the problem, but the character of the traditions, 
that all of us have inherited and that provides substantial structure to much of our lives most of the time. The third and specifically Christian step for using the Bible productively in academic life is to recognize not only the presence but the necessity of Christian traditions of biblical interpretation. It can be a difficult lesson for those of us who want to exalt biblical authority over all other authorities to admit that the Bible per se does not provide a satisfactory grounding for Christian learning. The Bible per se is too easily the source of what Martin Luther called delusions that arise when the individual conscience runs wild through the scriptural landscape. It is the narration or the message of redemption in the Bible as a whole that can become a satisfactory grounding for Christian learning. For educational purposes, therefore, it is necessary to define the foundational character of Scripture carefully. It is not the Bible alone in any simple sense that can serve as a platform for Christian learning. It is rather the Bible's narrative or story or existential offer of redemption that provides the necessary depth, clarity, and capacity upon which education can be based. The modern Christian university needs a forceful sense of the Bible's message and not just the Bible alone as it sets about its work. But when we talk about forceful apprehensions of the Bible's message, we are immediately talking about Christian traditions of biblical interpretation that have stood the test of time. In fact, I think I'd like to say, I'd be, I'd be actually interested to find counterexamples, I'd like to say that all consequential attempts by Christian believers to use the mind effectively have been grounded in a particular interpretation of the message or narrative of scripture rather than the Bible alone. For Catholics, this has often been a variety of Thomistic Aristotelianism. For some Calvinists, it's been covenant theology. For Lutherans, a dialectic of law and gospel. For liberal Protestants, a systematic deference to modern learning. For Mennonites, the principles of non-resistant pacifism. And for the Orthodox, a particular reading of humankind in relationship to the Incarnation. Each of the major Christian traditions claims to be biblical, and each offers many illustrations of believers who embrace a particular interpretation of Scripture with the full force of individual conscience. But each one is also more than simply biblical. The critical question for Christian higher education is not whether such systems exist, but whether the intellectuals who rely on them have made significant contributions that endure and that are obviously Christian. My conclusion is that the best of Christian intellectual life has historically been nurtured within specific Christian traditions marked by two things. First, the mere Christianity of the classical creeds, and second, a productive depth of insight into the human condition or the nature of the universe itself. Some examples can show what I'm talking about. The best Christian philosophy of the 21st centuries appears in Catholic circles that have been working hard at first order philosophical problems since the 13th century, or in Calvinist circles that have been doing the same since the 16th century, or from others who've gone to school on either the Catholics or the Calvinists or both. The work of Johann Sebastian Bach and Soren Kierkegaard was indeed marked by personal genius, but genius given shape, density, and color by the Lutheran tradition they embraced. Dorothy L. Sayers was a productive novelist, playwright, and critic because she simply had the goods, but also because she practiced an Anglo-Catholic sacramentalism that had been wrestling with aesthetic realities since the late 16th century. The anthropologist E. E. Evans Pritchard, Victor Turner, and Mary Douglas displayed exquisite skill in their ethnographies, but their deepest anthropological insights are unthinkable without considering the Catholic faith they all embraced. There's certainly, uh, there's certainly been a lot of good academic work accompanied by Christian believers who are not closely identified with specific Christian traditions, but not the best work or the work that has been most helpful the longest time to the most other believers. If by insisting on academic life governed by the Bible alone, 
and the authority of the individual conscience alone, you undermine the great Christian traditions, you can be guaranteed to harvest a meager crop of Christian learning. So the last thing I'd like to say to a Baptist university like Baylor, which aspires to be both more Christian and better academically, might move, and I'd like to recommend how it might move to an even more productive appropriation of scripture. It's obvious that I do not think that a Baptist platform as such is the way to go. But the feisty, Bible-centered individualism of Baptist tradition offers a most engaging prospect. You are Baptists and have a tradition of not kowtowing to authority. If you use that spirit of independence to welcome academics from all the major historical Christian traditions who want to prosecute their work by using the deepest insights of their traditions to study the deepest problems of human learning, you would be using the Bible in the contemporary Christian university in just the right way. In addition, if you would actively nurture those scholars, institutes, and programs that were trying to show the Christian and academic payoffs from following historical Baptist dispositions, you would be doing a great service to Baptist communities and to the American academic community as a whole. And if you could demonstrate the historic Baptist courage in the face of the powers that be, if you could be courageous when those powers that be are unexamined local traditions, when those powers that be are national political enthusiasms, when those powers that be are the conventions of elite American academia, then Baylor University would be doing both Christian and academic worlds the greatest possible service. There can be no doubt about it. Keeping your balance on the high wire strung between orthodox Christian faith and contemporary intellectual life is difficult. It means heeding scripture and staying engaged in my discipline's ongoing discussions. It means attending to the creator and attending to the creation. It means believing in divine purpose and opening myself to insights from all of God's creations. In other words, when it comes to the modern Christian university, doing right by both Christian and modern university, narrow is the gate and few there be that find it. But Baptists have resources that can function like a balance pole on the high wire. In your Baptist heritage, you have many examples of fortitude in the face of great oppression. The place of scripture in the modern Christian university is indeed a problem. But those who understand the life-giving character of the Bible, the wisdom in its pages to orient the task of scholarship, and the kind of personal commitment it can inspire are in an excellent place to get on the high wire and show the rest of us how to go forward and not fall off. Thank you. We're going, we're going to take a few questions. I would imagine that this has uh, stimulated some conversation, so uh, we're going to let Dr. Noel moderate the questions himself, and there'll be uh, microphones out in the audience. Yes. Mark, can I go back to the start and the comment about Luther appealing to scripture and reason? Yeah. I think what he meant then, in a pre-enlightenment context, was not appealing to the supremacy right. of reason, but rather engaging in all the arts of rhetoric. Right. I wonder if you'd care to comment on the place of rhetoric alongside scripture as the art of persuasion in the Christian university. Yes, that's actually quite a pertinent uh, question about Martin Luther's uh, uh, own educational um, uh, enterprises. Some of you will know that um, in the first rush of Protestant enthusiasms, uh, there were uh, there was even a worse situation for higher education than has existed in the United States over the last two or three years with the recession. 
the University of Wittenberg, for example, went from several hundred students to barely a hundred in just a matter of years because uh, so tied up was the church with the institutions of higher learning that when Luther attacked the church, it seemed like he was attacking also all of the institutions and traditions of higher learning. So, in his, his uh, typically uh, uh, relaxed and, and uh, 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 fashion, Luther wrote a pamphlet, substantial pamphlet, in 1525 called something like to the, to the princes and churches of Germany, in which he attacked parents for not sending their children to school, which would have been school using the traditional quadrivium and then later on the trivium. And in the calm Luther style, he said, you are worse than despicable hogs eating your own children if you do not give your kids the education that we can rescue from the corruptions of the Catholic Church. What did that education look like? He handed the, the business over to his friend Philip Melanchthon, and it was the reconstitution in, in a lightly Protestant form of the quadrivium and the trivium, including the, the skills of, of rhetoric. Now, I don't myself think that Luther was a, 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 a good example of how to persuade other people to um, <laughs> take your position. He, he was a passionate, proclaimer, by comparison with some of his fellows, he actually was ahead of the, I mean, it's terrible to say this, but Luther felt that people who disagreed with him should be exiled. We don't think of that in modern America as a, as a, as a favorable way of handling your opponents. But at many of the other uh, principalities of, of, of Europe, if you disagreed with the leading authority, you were killed. I'd rather be exiled than killed. So we have, we have a word in Luther, but, but what he was saying, and I think David's drawing attention to that paraphrase where Luther uses reason, he was not attacking education. He was trying to use education in a profitable way, and he had the fullest use for many of the, his, of the educational traditions that had come down to his, to his day. Yes, there's a question here and then over here. Yes. You, you might maybe use the mic and others can hear you. I'm confused. What I'm understanding is Martin Luther said we've got two standards by which we judge right and wrong. Right. Scripture and consciousness. Before God, right. Now, what I'm hearing, if I'm hearing correctly, is you're saying we introduce a third standard, right. which aren't we marching back to right. a Catholic Church sole standard? Yes, that's a, quite an appropriate question. The way I think I would answer the question from looking at the 16th century is to say, what did Martin Luther do? And I'm not going to defend what Martin Luther did, but, but think about how he introduced his New Testament. Ideally, I would like this testament go out with no preface, but I'm providing a preface because certain irresponsible individuals have run away with the truths of the gospel. Think about his attitude toward Karlstadt. Again, it led to a, a coercive constraining of conscience, but Luther thought that the, the properly directed conscience to the proper understanding of scripture would automatically rule out what Karlstadt proposed by way of reforming the church. So you could say, you could say, Martin Luther announced principles that he immediately contradicted and the problem was in the contradiction. I would say Martin Luther announced principles that served him well when he was at the court of Charles V and served him not so well when he was trying to reconstitute education, religion, economic life even, in his native Wittenberg. Um, this, is, this will be maybe a Presbyterian wasting my energy trying to convince Baptists of what they should believe. <laughs> but I think that hard 
critical self-awareness will teach anyone who says, I believe in the Bible alone, that in fact, they believe in the Bible interpreted through a specific set of traditions. So I do not believe in the Bible alone. I believe in a world in which God gave the scriptures as the key, last, final, and normative judge on all other things, but by no means the only judge of all other things. Now, if that uh, kind of statement is beyond the pale of what, what believers in the sole authority of scripture can, can handle, then I think there are many possibilities for lives of religious integrity, many possibilities of lives of ethical integrity, but no possibilities for Christian higher education. Because education is a long process that requires what I would call a biblical appreciation for what all of the creatures made in God's image have done over the course of human history. And that appreciation re requires not abandoning the Bible, but letting the Bible serve as a critic, judge, evaluator, and standard giver to the great fruits of, of, of creation. And because I was actually raised a Baptist before I became a Presbyterian, I can quote you a Bible verse. <laughs> And it is the Apostle Paul standing in the Areopagus and telling those who are curious about the, the image to the unknown God that, that God has given himself and that he is near to every kind. And that the poets of the Greeks are worth quoting when Paul is trying to present a message that he wants to ground on the scriptures. So that is a very good question, and in some sense, it's the only Protestant or Baptist question that should be answered. And it isn't really, it's a different way of asking the same question that David asked. So I thank you for that. There was a, uh, someone over here. Uh, Dr. Noll, I want to thank you for uh, the encouragement you've given us as Baptists to, to pursue the intellectual life. and. Um, I think our applause was very genuine, but I can't help but think there's a, some amount of fear and trepidation. Um, it, the, the, that is a daunting task. And um, I think of even the last 10 years, there have been a number of controversies right. that faculty, staff at Baylor have been involved with, with trying to uh, uh, even speak freely about what the Baptist tradition means as an intellectual. Right. How, how does that, that call to fortitude also balance with the call to prudence uh, in, in, in being an intellectual um, when there's the, the tyranny of the masses and um, you know, the, the, the tweetings on Twitter that can distort the facts? Uh, how do we survive that as a university? Well, it has been several centuries since the Presbyterians have had any fortitude, so I'm not... I'm not... <laughs> Not quite sure how to respond to those of you who have some left. Um, no, I think Baylor's experience over the last 20 years is, is, a, is a very instructive history, um, showing both uh, potential but problems in, in, in trying to do, as many, many voices associated with Baylor have, have said they want to do, is to become more Christian and more academically excellent. Both of those goals are, must be interpreted goals. Uh, if, if this was a, um, um, a, a strictly defined Mennonite institution, it would be quite clear what it meant to be more Christian. Um, um, and, and it probably would be fairly clear what it meant to become better academically. But, but I, I, to me, one of the strengths of Baptist tradition is that it has actually uh, come closer to the, um, to the plurality of not just humankind, but specifically Christian communion. So I, I've been told that there are or a Baptist church, at least in Waco, where people wear kind of robes and have liturgies and things, and they're Baptists. And then 
churches in, in, in Waco that seem more Baptistic to me where you, where you announce a revival, bring a revival preacher. And, and, and this, these don't look to me like the same kind of churches, but they're Baptists. So, so what I'm taking from that kind of experience is that a strength of Baptist tradition is its very variety. Uh, of course, the weakness is you have to get, if you want people to sit in the same room and vote by the end of the day on how many credit hours you're going to give for such and such, and you got these revved up Baptists, you might be in for a long meeting. But, <laughs> but, but, but the way Baylor, I, I don't know a whole lot about the history way back, but my sense is that, that in, in its positioning in Texas history, Baylor was quite, Baylor leaders were quite intelligent in balancing different aspects of local Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, Austin culture, and, and maneuvering wisely while preserving Baptist distinctives. Now, my understanding of the most recent enterprises is that uh, the Baptist element remains the freedom not to be committed to Aristotelianism, not to be committed to a particular Baptist theology, not to be committed to um, the, the pacifism that I think was present in some of the early Baptists, but, but to have a more general, a more welcoming, but genuinely Christian approach to higher learning. Now, whenever you say things like general, general, generally <laughs> Christian, then, then you've got a debate. And uh, one, of, one of the reasons I'm confident that a place like Baylor can do at least some of the things that, that it's trying to do it is because of examples of current Baylor faculty who are known as Calvinists and Catholics and, and Jews and, and the Orthodox, who actually have done significant things that are recognized in the academic world as Christian from a Baptist institution. So it's like maybe a lot of things in life. It just can't be done. But it is, it's, it's being done, it's here. So I get on the plane tomorrow, weather permitting, with Maggie, my wife, and we head back to Notre Dame, where it has its own problems. And you've got to deal with the problems here, but you also get to deal with the potential here. And, and I, don't, I'm, I am speaking sincerely and in, in saying I think that the very, the great variety within Baptist traditions gives a place that is willing to advance courageously a real opportunity to serve the Christian world as a whole, and in that service, to do an unusual service to the American ac Academy as a whole as well. Yes, thank you for your very uh, um, interesting uh, talk. My question is, though, um, in your comments on things like intelligent design, creation science, and so forth, um, in that we should trust uh, creation, you know, God's creation and, and people in creation and research and so forth. What about the great tradition, and especially Baptist tradition, of questioning establishment and so forth? Could you comment on that? Yes. The, the, the Baptist willingness to question hierarchy is, is a real potential strength. Um, but again, it, I, I would think that the, the, the character of that potential Baptist strength is like the character of my recommendation of tradition. So it's not a recommendation of tradition without judgment or discrimination. It's a, it's a recommendation of tradition that asks people to evaluate claims of being faithfully Christian by the various, various uh, traditions that are promoted. So that s simply because someone claims I'm a representative of such and such Christian tradition should not bring evaluation and, and discrimination and, and careful thinking to a close, but, but demands a response. Is, is this in fact? something that uh, draws upon, inspires by a particular tradition that leads to the, then unusual insight. It'd be the same with Baptist 
uh, 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 resistance to authority. Some of those resistances are wise. Some are not wise. Some are lead, uh, productive and could lead to great insights. Some are self-destructive and suicidal. Which are which? It takes wisdom, patience, uh, insight from any number of individuals, consultation, not taking a vote, however, but accumulating wisdom. So no outsider can tell a person who's, who's aware of the Baptist heritage of courageous opposition to oppression when you want to do that. I mean, I, I can tell you, but of course that doesn't, that doesn't help. You, you've got to decide that for yourself. And it, is, it seems to me, that particularly in our ecumenical age, it's a mark of human progress and a particular uh, blessing of the Holy Spirit to, to have the capacity to learn from the criticisms of those who are not of your stripe. I'm mean, saying this obviously is an evangelical Protestant at Notre Dame where some of that happens. Not, not as much as you'd like to see, but some of that happens. And I think that as, as Baptist institutions try to decide which of the many, many options are possible to take in higher education, that the, the wisdom discerning process will include listening to Baptist resources, but also consulting the faithful more generally. And for academic purposes, the faithful are sometimes people who don't realize that they're doing God's work and telling us about the world. Yes. Yes. Roger Olson. Um, could I push you just a little bit on your recommendation to us? Is it that because Baptists lack a hermeneutical tradition, we adopt one, say at Baylor, or is it that we just absorb many different ones and allow many different ones to speak within our institution to us? And I kind of heard you saying both of those, but they're not the same thing. Right. So could you pin it down and be a little more specific for us? My recommendation is that uh, 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 because of the Baptist heritage, Baptist institutions are in a position to allow different Christian traditions to flourish. One of those traditions that Baptist institutions should encourage to flourish would be efforts to take Baptist dispositions to see if you could develop uh, a Baptist history of science by relying upon rights of private judgment and the gathered church. See if you could develop a distinctly Baptist approach to the history of art. See if you could encourage a particularly Baptist uh, a approach to literary efforts, to poetry. I don't think you could do it. But I'd, it'd be the one, most wonderful thing in the world if there was an identifiably Baptist author about whom you could say, as one can say of Tolkien about the Catholic influences, that this great writer has illuminated the human condition by offering to all humankind the deep riches of Baptist tradition. That would be wonderful. And God speed all of you who try to do that. So uh, but, uh, your, your question is an entirely fair one. My answer is that I was talking about the latter rather than the former. Because I don't think there is a Baptist hermeneutic. There is a disposition to give priority to the rights of conscience, which I think has contributed immeasurably to the, 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 to the world and to the Christian world particularly. But once you, once you give priority to the rights of conscience, and you have a general Baptist and a particular Baptist both convinced that they, their hermeneutical their, their uh, valid hermeneutics have come to the right conclusion. Baptist uh, history is just littered, more than other groups, I don't know, that may be a good question, it's just littered with these internecine battles. 
that are engaged in by entirely honorable people, entirely convinced that they are following the written word of God. What usually comes is that after the, the grieving wounded are passing the scene, the traditions recover and, and go on their work, but, but not, with, not by solving the differences between, as you, as you very well know, E.Y. Mullins and A. H. Strong or, a, or a, a Walter Rauschenbusch. Each of those people have something to offer, but I don't know how you could possibly collect a Baptist perspective from Strong, Rauschenbusch, and Mullins. You, could, you have insights aplenty from all three in some conjunction, but, but not, not the same. I should take your courses, I know. I know. Maybe we could have one more question or comment, and then uh, those of you who've been at the King James Conference know that you've sat down for a long time. Yes, we have a question. Right here. You've given a suggestion. Here's the microphone that lives out. You've given suggestions as to what a Baptist institution might be able to do to walk that tightrope from your investigation of the history of Christianity. Do you have any examples of Baptist institutions that have done that? Well, we, we, we have in the audience several of the world's leading Baptist historians that I'd like to punt that question to, but um, well, let's, let's put it this way. I, I think there, is, there are long histories of Baptist institutions that have done other things well over, over time. Um, I think the, the British, uh, the, the Baptist Missionary Society, the, the, the various Baptist mission societies in the uh, United States and Canada have a, have a very long record of faithful and yet flexible missionary promotion. Um, No, I, I probably can't think of a Baptist intellectual institution that over time, clear, clearly there have been moments when, when I think, uh, Rochester, when Strong and Rauschenbusch were all, all, both in the faculty. That would have been a wonderful place to, to be. But uh, I, I, don't, I don't think that the, the, the power of their work uh, was sustained for, for, for a long period of time. Um, I, I think, however, that uh, the world changes. Uh, the uh, the, the divisions within the Christian world soften. Um, the, the places where leaders have been put in place that have uh, both Christian and intellectual ambition are broaden out. And that uh, even though I'm a historian and by disposition just puddle glummish, Eeyore-ish to the, to the core, I want to say as my last word here that the best may be yet to come. Thank you very much.